So we have two files, uh, traits and relations. So one file is the traits file. Can you see there? I guess you can also look at that. It has three columns. First column is just names of some people. It looks like the second col the second column is some numbers. Uh, it turns out to be actually age. And the third column is genders, female or male. So, you know, it's common demographic data that you can collect about people, about uh, zebras, about sheep you guys were collecting, um, whatever it is. So for each individual, you have a row here. And, and, and whatever the demographic data you have, you can have reproductive status here, you can have uh, 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 time since uh, you know how long they've been at the at the this particular location, all those kinds of things. Now, the second file relations, the relations file uh, talks about uh, the, there are two columns. Uh, first two columns are pairs of individuals by their first name, and then the third column is whether they're in the same room together or not. Okay, this is the no, yes. So that's the proximity. This is the simplest kind of proximity information. What's N mean? Not in the same room, yes. In the same room together. So they, they, these are co-workers, and so these co-workers are in the same, whether they have been in the same room or not. So if you look at it, there's a little bit of an explanation of, um, right. So, so this, okay, so, Okay, are you guys okay there? Yeah, I think so. We, we can see what you've got. Yep, we have those. Okay, so, so this column is whether they're in the same room or not, and then the third column is how many times they have seen, they've interacted as friends, is this column. And the last column is how many times uh, w the first person gave advice to the second person. Okay? So you can imagine, as I said, that the yes, no, that's a proximity kind of relationship the, in the same room. You can, we've done this uh, for, for zebras or for many other, uh, for any kind of animal, you can see are they being together observed in the same group? At a particular time, um, it's unweighted too. It's, it's unweighted. unweighted. It's yes, no, it's right? Zero network. Right. It's zero, zero network. Zero one network. Right. It's a zero one network. Are they in the same room or not? Well, here the assumption is that essentially it's it's their their relation. They're being working, being in the same room, working in the same room doesn't change. Uh, but it's it's uh, it, you can imagine it being uh, also derived from say GPS colors. You can say that they're close together if they're within certain threshold distance, and so then same room, be the same bubble. It's, the, it's right. The, whatever whatever we want to use as our criteria. Exactly. So th this is a proximity relation. This is a friendship. So that and and it's undirected. So. In this, oh, sorry, it's it's. Uh, What's four mean? What's five mean? How many times, Bob, and uh, Bob and Alice, uh, were interacting as friends? Okay. Okay. So not necessarily in the same room, just anywhere on the planet. Anywhere on the planet, yes. So, uh, right, and the last one is a directed relationship. The last one is how many times did Bob give advice to Alice? Okay, so it's Bob. It's 
it's the first column to the second column. Right. A to B. Right. It doesn't have to be then sym uh, symmetric. So if you... Uh, <coughs> Yeah, you could have a column F, it could be B to A. Right, so B. if you, so in this particular case, it is symmetric, but it doesn't have to be. So, well, so, it's not, no, it's not, it's not necessary. Right, so, so, uh, so, it's so, not, right, it's, it's not, not symmetric. The fourth, one is, the fourth one is not symmetric. It's three times they were together anywhere in the world, but, but Bob gave out, gave out, or David gave Alice advice for them. Right, but so, uh, and just because David gave uh, Alice advice four times doesn't mean that Alice gave David advice four times. So, um, she made that right, so if you look at Alice and David, Alice gave David advice three times. So, so this can be, let's say, grooming relationship in animals or, uh, or aggression or whatever is a directed relationship in this case. Right, and so we now want to start asking questions about this data set. So, is the person, maybe your questions are, you know, is the person who gives out most advice, is that the oldest one, maybe? Uh, or is there any correlation between how much advice is given versus uh, age? Do men give out more advice than, than uh, women? Do women, are women more friends among themselves than they are with men. So all kinds of questions now that we can ask about this data set. And the easiest way to do that is to formulate it as a, as a network and then ask questions about the network itself because then you don't only focus on one individual or a pair of individuals. You can ask it about the entire um, data set. So for that, we go to R. And well, it's, a slight, it's a slight difference. Connie, let me, if, if you just wanted to know, do men give more advice than women? Right. You would be able to just do that by a t-test, independent of a network and independent of who they give the advice to. Correct. Whether many different individuals. The network gives you the added benefit to look at the distribution of the connections and the advice, as opposed to just the aggregated average. Correct. Right. So you not, not only are going to look then at correlations or averages, but you can look at, uh, you can ask questions about reciprocation, you can ask questions, and we'll take a look at it. Do individuals who give more advice also receive more advice overall from others who also give more advice? Things like that. So, uh, and you can look across networks and say, right. those, those that give advice to many, do they also tend to be with them? Right. Is is in and in this case, in general, you can ask. You know, is just giving advice is that a function of proximity in some way? Are they just you know uh, uh, by circumstances they happen to be among uh, with many other people and so they just you know give advice because they're already asked for advice because they're already there or they're just, they're just chatterboxes they can't help themselves is the null hypothesis right so 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 when you compare say proximity network and uh, advice network you can start answering those questions right and, we, and, and in essence there's two proximity networks here there's the zero one proximity network are they in the same room and then the number of times they associate anywhere in the world column D is more right. of a weighted Right. Network of proximity. So right. we're looking at a zero-one network and a weighted network. Right. You can also ask questions of, uh, say, the advice of the proximity network. Is uh, is it the same kind of distribution? So, for example, maybe are women more egalitarian than men in terms of their friendship? Right. So we can do the degree to measure. Right. So we can do degree to mention it to measure it. We can also ask, uh, you know, in terms of proximity, are there kind of close-knit communities and is advice given within those close-knit communities? So the communities from, say, this relationship of friendship, and is advice given only within close-knit communities or does it go across communities? Uh, so, we, so we could do that by connected components or by cliques, right? Uh, by communities. You actually can do communities, uh, okay. which is a little bit more uh, sophisticated kind of... Uh, extraction of those close-knit components, yeah.
let's do those, if you would say, okay? Okay, so let's, let's start. So hopefully by now everybody has loaded uh, the iGraph library. And now, okay, and now we can read the traits file. So that traits file is that uh, traits CSV. So if you try just doing this, it says error. It says error, right. Because what you really need to do is, is, is either change directory or give it the full uh, the full um, path. So if you notice, my traits file is in the directory documents, teaching, Kenya Aussie, 2011, nodes, traits, CSV. So if I look at my files, here is a, it's, it's in my documents folder, uh, uh, teaching, Kenya Aussie, 2011, nodes, and there it is, traits, CSV. Okay, so you actually need to give it full, uh, full path. Oh, that's a pain. There's a comment. You can find it. I can't even find it. Or you can change directory to wherever. Um, change your directory. Well, okay. yeah, does it know, does it know where it's saved in? No, it didn't save it. It's probably in download. In download. Well, first about the desktop, but all I got was a web thing and a text thing which I didn't want. Dan, so Dan, yeah, yeah, yeah. I Dan. Go back and find it. Yeah. It's it, in downloads. It, it's in downloads. So if you go to. Oh, I, I didn't know. I didn't save it in downloads. I okay. I can, It'll be there anyway. Is what yeah, you're saying. Okay. Yeah. So if you, it's it, it default is probably downloads. So if you go, uh, your directory is still the downloads. Tilda. Huh? He's on a Macintosh. Yeah, I'm on a Mac. Um, Dan, I can send you the files. Okay, I'm doing Tilda download. Yeah, so nothing happened. Tilda download. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to run on my color green So if, if you go to. If you go to that file and save it again, you can tell it save as and give it the exact place that you can. That's what I did. That's what I did. But I'll go. I'll go find you again. Okay, hold on. Okay. So if you go to uh, if you go to the traits CSV, once you're there, you can uh, file save as and you can tell it where you want to save it. Sorry, uh, where you want to save it. So. You know, probably I don't want to save it in recommendations, but I want to save it as um, uh, so just give it the exact location either maybe desktop is a good place to Yep, but I have to get rid of the text. Page source, right? Yeah. And save it on, on desktop. All right, I did that supposedly. Next one, relations. Mm -hmm. What's the change directory for now? Hmm? It's in the list menu. That's what I'm doing. Keeps putting a text on it. Hmm? It's in the list menu now. First one is change. All right, let's see if they're there. What's the command? Give me the command. Okay. I have a relation CSV and a trait CSV. Is that what I'm supposed to have? Yeah. All right. Now what do I do? Find them. They're on my desktops. Okay. So, Serenius, you can change the directory. Okay, they, they, they're telling me. Okay. Do it as downloads. 
So no, just put it as name the base relation. So you have to do the so I can um, so I just type relation. You have to do it to be honest. Did you read there uh, with the read CSV? So so name it. And instead of doing that whole path she has in quotes, put up your file name dot CSV. Which one are we doing? Um, We're doing this. Okay, mine said it might be easy, just so it's um so you have to do quotes. Yeah. Oh, you have to do quotes? Mm -hmm. Here, Dan, it's on the screen right now. That's what you do. Yeah, I'm doing it. Yeah. Do I have to do CS, do I have to do um, comma head equals false? Yes. It just says that there is no header in that file. OK. And then you read the same. Error, error, error. <laughs> No, it's not there. Did you change your directory to desktop? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm okay. Okay. And so then you read the same way you read uh, the relations file. So then you do either the full path or just the relations. You want to do the relations one too, not just the trace one? Yes, both of them. Because the relations is going to give us the edges. Uh -huh. So I'm just going to do REL, whatever you did there. REL right. space. Read. You can just do equals, right? Yeah. Three. So for new R, you can do equals. You don't need this silly error stuff. Okay. Okay. Are you guys, everybody else, okay there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now we can, we've read the files, now we can start creating a network out of it, or rather a graph. So we start always with an empty graph, because if you don't start with an empty graph, it doesn't initialize the memory, and so you never actually know what you're going to get if you just start adding nodes and edges to G. Also, if you add more than once, it doesn't replace what's there, it keeps on adding things, so it keeps allocating new nodes. So, the reason I was upset to begin with was that it's case sensitive. Um, so, okay. So, you start with a g equals empty gra graph dot empty, and then we can start adding vertices. No, it won't recognize the command if it's not there. Is there a way that you could elongate the R console screen and then shorten it a little bit so that it's in the upper third of the screen? Because I can't see. If that makes sense. You, no. Uh, what? You can't see what? I can't see the bottom of the script, so I was wondering if you could move the bottom of the script up higher onto the screen. Because I there are heads in front of my field of view. <laughs> Just comes over here, right? Oh, wait a minute, just a mess about you. Mm -hmm. Then the next view. Is, yeah. that, is that better? No? Yeah. That's fine. No, I'll, I'll deal with it. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, okay. So we start, we initialize the empty graph, and then we start adding vertices. So we have to add vertices and edges separately. In general, a network or a graph, what we call a graph, is defined. As an object, it's what are the vertices and what are the edges, otherwise also known as nodes and edges. So we first add all the vertices, and those are the individuals in this case. And we add them. Okay, so the number, the number of individuals are, is going to be the number of vertices, which is the same as the number of rows in that traits file. Right? The name of the vertices is the um, is is whatever is the first column of the traits file right and the age 
attribute is whatever is in the second column of the traits file, and gender is whatever is in the third column of the traits file. We just convert whatever is there from characters to actual values. Huh? So you can copy paste from the email that I sent you guys because uh, all those commands are there, or you can copy them from the uh, from from the uh, web page that I sent. Um, I have a question. So yes. When I do the um, the uh, I have a bunch of rows that say NA before they have. See, I re it again. You re it? Yeah. Okay. Which did you rewrite? The G is. Now I still have that problem. Right. So. Right. So if you added empty, okay, graph empty, you have to initialize first. If you keep on adding things, it's going to keep on adding vertices. And then you're going to. I got an error message when I said G equals graph empty. Um, that one works. I got an error message. It's unexpected. Quote. So in that email, what? Okay. Um, so if anybody else is having the same problem as I did, I typed the command wrong first, so it filled up the graph that with NAs. So you have to go back and empty it. Like right. Yeah. So, so if it's at this point, at this point, it's good to type just G. No, I'm getting errors all over the place. I must have typed something wrong. It says unexpected, unexpected comma somewhere. Oh, okay. I have. Copy paste from the file. Dan, just copy paste from the file or from the email that I sent. I sent the email I, with the commands. You can just copy paste from there. When did you send the email? The same email that uh, from November 9th. Oh, uh, what did you say your error was? Because I'm getting an L too. Um, okay, did, so if you no, yeah. ever, um, you if you made a mistake the first time, adding things into that empty graph, yeah, I didn't so you didn't make a mistake? No. Yeah. I had to do it twice and didn't make a mistake. Can someone explain why? I don't have anything. I don't have any, I just have those three things to, um, to download. Okay. One of those, uh, one of those is the... Right. One of those is a file with commands. So the three things that, it, that you're downloaded, the third one, so it's traits, relations, and the third one. The third one uh, is the file with all of those commands. That's the import on one. Is that that one? Yeah. Oh, I see. All those commands. Just put all those in? Okay. You can put cool. all those in. You can copy paste them. So you do them one by one and, and see the effect of those commands. Yes. Oh, you do one by one and then... You can, I, I prefer that you guys do one by one so you actually see what they're doing. Okay, I'll do that. Okay. Let me go back Because in a minute we're going to do something different from that file and we're going to do it interactively. Oh. <laughs> that worked. Okay. One. I have to do all of them now, right? So now. Uh, we're going to give a name. So check that you did the right thing, right? Check. Well, it didn't give me an error, but it's, it's okay. All right. I mean, it's loading them. It's not giving me errors, but it's not doing Everybody here, um, follow the instructions. It's working. Uh, okay. Let's make sure that we did the right thing. We'll type v uh, parenthesis g uh, dollar sign name. Right. Well, hold on. I'm still doing add to the edges. No, no, no. Before you add edges. <laughs> I've done all four of them one by one. Fine. No. Great. Okay. So just check that we have the right graph. Let's. Uh, I don't have a, am I supposed to get a picture? No. 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 Uh, type G. Everybody, G. type type G. Yes. You should see uh, something. If you type G, you should see something like this. I got everything. I've got to get all the names. Great. So you should have 10 vertices, 34 edges, it's, it's directed, and then you have all those edges. 
Yeah, okay. I have zero is Bob Bradford, one is Cecil Connor. I understand. Okay, so now, before we do anything else, uh, let's do the following, guys. So, so we actually see some action. Let's see what it looks like. Let's type plot, parenthesis G. At the very bottom, plot. What type of parentheses? These are just checking to make sure you have the right. You're at it. You're at it. Oh, I got a graph. Yay! Mine is different. I'll explain why. <laughs> Everybody else should have. Uh, um, I'll here. Okay. Here. Okay. 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 So everybody got a graph. So the, so the numbers are the nodes as listed on that list. Yes. Yes. Okay. So eight is Gabby to Bob Bradford. So um, Tanya, I'm getting um, sweet, the, oh, yeah. but not the connection. Same between them and so is Kathy. Because you haven't added edges, which is good, which is fine. Dan went ahead and did all those commands. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, you haven't added edges yet. So we're going to come back now and add the edges. Let's do that. We just, you know, this is just to kind of see the action, what's going on and what it, what it translates to as a network. So yes. now so now we're going to add edges. Uh, so here's the command, right? So we're going to add edges. This one, uh, sorry, not this one, uh, the one where, uh, um, right, so, so we first have to just define what, what, what each edge is. So the way we do it, we tell it the from part, right, each edge is going to be from node to a node, from vertex to a node, uh, to a vertex. And so the from part is whatever is in the relation in the rel relations file column one and two for each edge is going to be whatever in the is in the relations file column two right if we remember the f the relations file the first two columns tell us who is interacting with whom who is in the same room what is for that relation what are the two people involved right so what are the columns for it Column one, comma two, or eleven. Which column. Which column. Look in per column, this column. Yeah. So now we're ready to define edges. So the edges then it's the matrix of the. Uh, oh, we didn't do the IDs. Sorry, sorry. Um, let's let's uh, go back a little bit. We're going to now, we just have names. If you just added the, the vertices, we just have names. We don't have IDs. And nowhere in the file traits do we have the IDs of individuals. And so we refer to them by names. Would be nice to actually have the, uh, the IDs for each individual just say, this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So the way we're doing it is uh, we take the names. Right, and so the names is a uh, a list. This one variable is the entire list of names. So we're going to split it. Uh, right, we're going to split it. If you if you type the if you type names, just type names. Sorry, just type um, not names. Just type. Sorry, uh, where is it? There it is. It just if you, if you just, the entire uh, V of G ampersand name, it's a list of, of all the names with uh, various, uh, with various uh, parentheses and everything. So that's, that, there it is, right? So it's, it's with uh, quotes separated by, uh, separated by uh, spaces, list of names with uh, each row being uh, numbered, whatever is the next, in the, the idea of the next individual. So we don't want it, we just want the names. And this is what this does. It splits that list of names of the vertices based on the spaces and it strips it of, uh, of the index for each individual. It takes the, uh, uh, the, the 
it takes away the, this parenthesis that, that uh, number each individual. Okay? So now we have, if you type names, what you'll see is just a list of names without parentheses, without uh, indices, without anything else. Now the IDs is also becoming, is going to become a list of the length, however many names there are. The minus one is because we start, uh, no, it, it shouldn't be minus one, I think it should be. Right, so because we, the length of the list of names, it doesn't have to be minus one, just the length of the list of names. And, uh, oh, because it starts with zero, sorry. So how come it's a one before Alice and a six before Frank? Why is there a two before Bob, a three before Cecil, a four before Dave? It shouldn't be. So now, if you do names of IDs, right, that's what's going to happen. Now you have a list and a, an array that connects names and IDs. So what this says, for every number, its name is going to be whatever the next name. It matches the list with the with the index for that name. Uh, actually, yeah. when you do the operation names, mm -hmm. as apply string split, that only takes the first name and discards the last name. But the quotes and the indexes are still there. When you do the assignments, the assignment, right. there, Sorry, yes. then you yeah, you're right. You're right. You yeah. Yeah. There. Right. And, uh, that's probably what. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so now the IDs array, this IDs variable, now holds all the individuals and their indices. So we can re now we can refer to each individual by its index. Okay. How come the numbers are different? Uh, under names, IDs, Alice has a one. Okay. Now Alice has a zero under IDs. Right. If you, go, if, if you just type in names, just type in names and see what happens. Right. So... Just do names. Yep. You see it's different? So... Because in computer science, for <laughs> we count everything from zero, not from one. Oh. I just want to know when I typed the names, I got the first thing in square brackets was a one right. before Alice. And then there was nothing before Bob, Cecil, David, or Esmer and Esmeralda, but six before Frank. So it was counting correctly, but it's doing it differently from the IDs, which gave Alice a zero. I think it's the line that it's on. Isn't my. Uh, it's, it's like the point I get seven in front of Gabby. Okay, yeah, but. It, but it, Right, so it basically counts whatever the new line is, puts the right number before Gabby, but it's indexed incorrectly. It's indexed with Alice's it's one. It's not indexed incorrectly. So, um, so f f forever and ever, it indexes, it indexes yeah. differently. This is this the this sort of the this, the the schizophrenic way uh, that computer science counts everything. We count everything from zero because. When you initialize everything, you initialize it to zero, and then you just add one for every additional object. This is a legacy. This is a history. This is whatever it is. This is how how all all variables, all arrays, all matrices, all counters in computer science start from zero. So for us, when we say the first object, it means the object with index zero, and this is exactly what you're seeing here. So the the this bracket thing. The IDs are the index. I just want to know why names start right. differently from the IDs. Because That's name all. says this is the first individual. So what it says in the bracket, it says this is the first individual, the second individual, and so on. So it, it tells you what the logical order of that individual actually is. IDs shows just the index. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Okay? So, oh. so we always have this weird thing of, you know, which is why... For example, that little hack of. Can you say just a second? Huh? So, which is why this little hack that IDs, if you notice, is the is goes from from the the length of names minus one. Yeah, because it takes the yeah. names, it takes the one away from. Uh, right. Alice. Yeah. Right. So. So now that we already have from and to uh, for each edge, we can add edges, but we're adding them as now as IDs. So edges is a matrix, right, of 
this is this creates a list of IDs, whatever the IDs of the from individual and the IDs of the to individual. Right? What's N C equals to? It's thank you. <laughs> That's for each matrix you have so the first column, this tells you this is one column. Those two things, that pair is one column. Okay? And uh, the, the, the number of columns is two. So, so, so these are the, sorry, the two columns. They, they, the C creates these two columns, and the number of columns is two. Those are the columns of the, that matrix, and that's the number of the, of, of the columns. So if you type edges after that, this is what you should see. So notice these is, this is now individual IDs, not the individual names. So read me the, the first row mean. What's the first row mean? What's one comma mean? It mean those are the indices. So those two, this is the row one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and so on, thirty-four. And these are the indices of the columns. So column one and two. The empty part after before the column is just uh, uh, I think those are the, the headers. Oh, one that has left, I think. So what's yeah. one zero? Just tell me in the real world. One means individual one, which is Bob, individual with index one, which is Bob, and zero means individual's index zero, which is Alice. And so there's one edge between them. Yes, and so now there is an edge between one and individual with index one and individual with index zero. Okay? So now let's plot that graph. Just type plot G now after you've added edges. So hopefully now you have edges in that plot. I got an error. Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 because we haven't added edges, sorry. So, right, we created edges, but we haven't added edges. So now we finally are ready to, to add, add them. So we're going to add edges, right? Okay. Mm. Okay. So I'll keep Made, made from this list of edges, and we're going to add attributes to the edges, which is, um, we, we're, we're adding three attributes to each edge. There is the room attribute, whether uh, the friend attribute, and the advice attribute for each edge. So what does that mean? Is that going to all be on one graph? Yeah, and you can and you can then later plot them based on each different attribute, right? So this is going to sum the zero one from room. No, it's not summing. Room. It's not summing. It's essentially keeping them as three different modalities of that edge. But there's only one line between them. There's only going to be one edge with an arrow on them, right? Depends how you plot. You can plot it explicitly based on the weight according to, say, room, and we'll show them, we'll, we'll do color by, by room. Okay. But, but anyway, I get So just do G. Still right. If I have to put any parentheses around plot G, because if I just write plot space G, I get an error. Yeah, I have to do that. You have to do the parentheses. Parentheses, plot, parentheses G. Okay, well, you didn't say that. Yeah, okay. Okay, it worked, but I didn't get it. Oh, I didn't get it. Okay. So, if you type G also, you should see now all of okay. this, all of that. What edges are these? Mm -hmm. So, these 34 edges are displayed. Which right. one of the relationships? I have 68 Everything. edges. Everything? Everything. Is so, you, because you added edges twice. You typed all the command twice by copy paste, I think twice. So every time, that's okay. That this is just for practice. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I type it a third time. I'll get up to ninety. Exactly. So let's look now at different attributes of. Um, let, let's no, look at, at, at some attributes of the 
Uh, where is it? So, um, of this graph that you guys have. So first, let's plot it, uh, let's say, according to the room. Yeah, oh, where is it? So, so, Let's um, let's let's start with uh, the edge color black for all of them. So E G E parenthesis G dollar sign color equals in quotes black. Okay. So I'm going to um, can you see there? So we're just going to assign color black for could you could you go back up? Yeah. Okay. So I was just moving it. It's just rotating that. But it's, 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 you have to do command plot again. Okay, so in a minute we'll do see how we can do it. So now let's see if they're in the same room. We want to have to show relationships. Okay, so now we want to see if they're in the same room. We want a red edge, not a black edge. So let's do that. So E parenthesis G. Now we put the condition right. If room, notice it's the equals equals. That's the logical equality. It's not the assignment of. Uh, room doesn't become Y, we're testing whether room indeed is Y. What happens to the if command? Don't need to. Uh, so we can just put the condition right there because it's a binary condition. You have to have a space there? I mean, where'd the if go? You don't need if. We're just testing. So room equals equals why there are only two possible outcomes of this either it's true or false if it's true then it's going to be assigned the color red if it's false it's not going to do anything okay then i have to go back to plot g right right so now you can after that uh, you can try just plot G, or you can plot a little bit in a little bit more sophisticated way. I didn't get any red when I plotted it. So, okay, so what we're going to do is the following. We're going to change the layout. So we're going to plot, but instead of just plot G, let's change the layout and plot it with edge color. Okay. So we're going to do G comma plot parenthesis G comma layout equals layout dot comma dot kawaii. It's a it's a force based layout. So the, uh, the 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 more connected the vertices are, the closer together they're going to be plotted visually. OK. And then. Uh, Edge dot color equals E parenthesis G dollar sign color. <laughs> Dan, you're a wonderful tester. <laughs> well, no, I'm just typing badly. So I have, you can I have you can still co copy paste 
from that file. So. Well, no, I don't have any of that stuff in that file. Huh? I don't have anything in that file. Oh, there's no flooding. Oh, okay. okay. Move it so I can go back to what I had to type. It says error in I parse plot parameters graph list. Did everybody manage to do it, guys? Yeah. yeah, but I have a plot something that I'm not quite sure how to interpret. So a number, you know, some of my arrows are definitely still black. Some of them are still red. Right. And a number of the weird superpositions of black and red arrows, or a black arrow with red tips, or a red arrow with black tips. Um, it's strange. Trying to do my variables and run the whole code again. Yeah, you just R N plus C D. If you added edges twice, it may be that now one edge is overwriting the other one. So one way to do it, you can do clean edges and repeat the command. So so or or start with an empty graph. It's the easiest and just do copy paste. Of the command. So, so G equal G assignment or equals uh, empty dot graph. Okay. So start from the beginning of creating the graph essentially, and then just copy all the commands that were add vertices and up to and including add edges. Could not find the empty graph. What I have to put in the empty graph? G. No. So um, the initial command, Gesundheit, um, the initial command, uh, sorry, graph empty, not empty graph. Oh, that's why. Yeah, okay. so, so graph dot empty. <laughs> yeah, so Dan, if you open the file, just copy paste from the file uh, all the add vertices and uh, add edges part. So now I have an empty graph, so now I have to go back and copy all that stuff again? Yeah, but you can copy it in one shot, not line by line. You don't need to do it line by line, just everything together. No, I, I just did it, okay. And now what? And I, now I go back to the, um, the colored thing I did yeah. before, right? Right, so now you can do a E of G color black, and now room equals Y color, and so on. Okay. Sorry. Um, Okay, so now we're going to do, uh, let's look at degree distribution in between those things and page rank. Okay. I don't have one for Okay, so if you've managed to plot that graph, um, we're going to now do the following. Uh, we're going to, let's look at degree distribution. So there is command, which is uh, degree. So you can try just degree of G. It will plot something. So degree G. It tells you the degrees of all the vertices in, in the same order as the index of the vertices. Can you guys see there, Princeton? Oops, sorry. So did you, ma is it is okay? You Everybody managed to do that? Yeah, that's too big though, how you have it now. Yeah, it. Thank you. Okay. Okay, now let's actually create the association. I, it's very hard for me, for example, to see, well, to remember the indices. Who was the first individual? Uh, maybe, I think it was Alice. I think this was Bob. I can't remember anybody else after that. So I want to have something which uh, kind of gives me for every individual by name what its degree is. So I'm going to, so dig, I'm going to then create a variable called a temporary variable for degree. Uh, there are a couple of ways of doing it, but here. So I'm creating a temporary variable for degree. So, sorry. 
that you don't need to do that. Um, so I'm creating a temporary variable degree uh, of d, right? And that should just hold all this entire list, list of all the degrees. Now I'm going to create an array which is which is the length of that list minus one just like before this new array degree deg okay and now okay now comes the fun part a little bit a little bit of logic uh, exercise so in that array for the, each index of the name I want to have, so for each name which is indexed by this location, I want to have the degree of that person. <laughs> okay? No, I didn't catch what we want to have, sorry. So how about, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this, but if you type this and then you'll see it, I think you'll see what, uh, what I'm trying to do. So don't if you try dead, you will have oh that didn't work out the right way. No. Uh, my logic is off, I guess. The alley of it too should be I put the things. Oh oh no no, this is right, right. So so uh so, so it's a little bit distracting because first it, li it lists, lists all the indices, but then it says, so Alice, Alice, 16, Bob, ah, too big. Uh, so it shows uh, Alice, 16, Bob, 12, uh, oh, okay. Cecil, 6, David, 4, Esmeralda, degree 6, Frank, 4, Gabby, 6, Helen, 2, and Iris, 6. Okay? So, uh, I can do the same things according to any uh, kind of uh, property that I can compute for each vertex. So, but before we go there, let's look at the distribution of degrees. So degree dot distribution parenthesis G. So, okay, so that tells you uh, how many vertices are with degree 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, um, uh, sorry four or five, the fraction of nodes with that distribution. Okay? Another way of reading it is... So what... The fraction of nodes that have degree... Zero in the first position. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, and sixteen. Okay. So it gives you the distribution. You can you can do some statistics with it if you need to, for whatever reason. But it gives you the the, the distribution of degrees uh, as probabilities, fractional, right? Now. Uh, you can compute. Those, those, are the, those are the degrees for every pair. No, those are degrees for every vertex. So each vertex now has a particular degree, right? Yeah, so every so, vertex is. So Alex yeah. has degree 16, so it has 16 uh, neighbors. Not neighbors, 16 total of uh, different kinds of interactions, weighted. This is weighted degree notice because uh, there are only 10 individuals total, so you can't have 16 unweighted degree. Right. So what's, what's other degree distribution is zero, <laughs> zero dot zero? That's how, uh, what's zero. the fraction of nodes with degree zero? This is the fraction of nodes with degree one. This is the fraction of nodes with degree two. This, 
Point one. There is only one node with degree two, which is Helen. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, so now we can, uh, let's look at betweenness. That's probably more interesting. So we're going to do the same kind of thing. We're going to take temporary, var temporary variable, which is B. It's betweenness, uh, B is the betweenness of G. Okay, so B is betweenness of G. Now we're going to create an array bet which is uh, 1 to the length of b minus 1 don't see don't look what I what I do there minus 1 and now we can uh, assign in that array the instead of just having them by uh, by indices we can I have the between us associated with every uh, individual. So here's the bet array, and we can see that Alice has between us 39, Bob is 12.33, and so on. So for me now, I'm dyslexic, so for me reading these numbers is not very meaningful. I want to plot now and somehow visually see who, which individuals are the big ones in terms of between us. So I'm going to plot, um, plot my um, graph, plot my network, uh, but I'm going to, to plot it where each vertex, its size of the vertex is proportional to its betweenness. Okay? So V, G, V, v parenthesis G uh, dollar size so each vertex has various attributes, which is size, color, uh, shape, um, label, things like that. So V uh, dollar size equals uh, betweenness, that bet. Uh, Uh, huh? Well, you can do you can do B. So you can do B, okay? B uh, and I because they, they are small numbers. Let's do them uh, maybe times five, <laughs> right? B. So between us uh, is B, or you can do directly between us. Between us of Okay. Okay. So betweenness of G. So V of G size is betweenness of G. Now I can plot it again and see what happens, right? So where is my plot? There it is. Uh, I can plot it. Ta-da! Right. So we can huh? Can you go back to the window again so we can see the code? Okay. Hmm? What? I don't know why. Oh. Maybe. I don't know. Is the calculation of, of um, mm -hmm. is, is getting the distribution of values of betweenness for every node in the network, is it somehow less computationally intensive than it seems like it must be? Um, you know, it seems like for even a moderately large network, that would be a, become a sort of prohibitive calculation to do. So, you are absolutely right. Between us is is a very hard in general. If you actually so the the first implementations of between us computationally for every pair you had to compute the paths and then for every vertex you count the number of paths from uh, that go through that vertex, right? So it turns out you can compute it once with uh, in a sort of 
so, so the direct way of doing it is this matrix multiplication algorithm which takes the matrix of all individuals by all individuals and it and computes it and computes the power the, the, the nth power of that matrix where n is essentially the number of individuals. So that's of course prohibitive for large networks. So recently there's a whole library that uh, computes various parameters like betweenness and all the other connectivity parameters in one pass over the network, which is amazing and, and it was algorithmically non-trivial thing to do. So you can compute them a lot faster. But uh, it works for medium-sized networks. What, what do we call medium-sized networks? Medium-sized networks are maybe tens of thousands. So those are medium-sized networks. Maybe 100,000 100, is still okay. It doesn't work above that because even computing just all, uh, computing paths between all the individuals is already prohibitive for something above 100,000. So what, what is done for really large networks like the, uh, world, uh, the web or the Twitter network or the blog network or, or Facebook or anything like that is, is actually we don't compute all shortest paths. Uh, there is a probabilistic sampling and you can show that for some sampling algorithms you get accurate estimate of the distribution of the paths if you do it right. So. Uh, so we, we essentially say we can give guarantees of within about 90% of the paths are, with, are, are distributed like what the sampling tells us. And in fact, uh, part of it in some way, and, and estimating parameters of a network correctly, including communities for large networks, is non-trivial. So Arun Maya, one of the PhD students from here, who graduated in May, who, whom Dan knows very well, at least by email. Uh, he, his entire PhD thesis was how to sample very large networks uh, to, uh, so that the parameters, the measures of the network on the sample are the same as, uh, or very close to the actual measures on the network. So you're absolutely right, it's a non-trivial thing, but we, for networks of tens of thousands of nodes, it's really not an issue. And I don't think in, in, in animal networks we're going to go above that. <laughs> okay, so that's betweenness. So if we uh, do betweenness, so let's actually plot it again. Um, so you see some nodes are tiny, 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 and some are big, big, big. So I actually want to uh, maybe normalize, if that's you have the same problem, you can normalize it a little bit. Uh, maybe by multiplying things uh, by five, if there is a problem, and now you're going to get this. So five may have been a little big, <laughs> right? Yeah, I did slash two plus twenty. Okay, so uh, so there are a couple of ways of normalize it, um, but maybe uh, going back like two, maybe. A good set. So here's so a, a zero. Going to be zero that's yeah. So, so there, there are some betweennesses that are zero, but clearly Alice and Bob are the two key individuals that somehow here between the two communities. And you can really see what the communities are about. There is the one room where Bob Bob is involved in a sort of goes between a couple of rooms here, right? So here's Bob, the green guy. Oh. Okay, so to get the same colors, let's get the same colors before we talk about Bob. You, you guys don't have the colors. So we're going to get node, node color. So we're going to get the color uh, here. The color of the nodes, size, uh, right, so I'm going to get, I'm going to start with the default color for all the nodes being green. So VG dollar color equals green. Okay. And then if gender is F, which is a female, I'm going to assign color blue just because. Mm. 
okay? And so now you should have, when you plot, you should have the same uh, plot as I do. <laughs> okay? Can I see the gender command again? Um, Where was the gender command? Uh, here. Um, One second. Uh, here. After the double equals, yeah. Okay. Well, see now. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can do whatever you want, of course, right? It's like whatever colors you like. So the, the size is by uh, uh, between this. So the VG per dollar size is between this of G. Okay. Um, I want to do a little bit more. Okay. So, um, so now you, you should, after you plot, if you plot again, uh, you, can, you, you should have similar looking network. And you can see, you know, now you can start visually assessing maybe what's going on. Uh, you can compute instead of between us, you can do maybe the size by page rank. Um, sorry. You can, uh, here, maybe I want the size now instead of um, by between us, I want page rank. And I'll talk a little bit about what page rank is. Oops, um, it's not page rank, I'm sorry. Um, it's page dot rank. So it's this, it's page dot rank vector. There we go. It's V size is page dot rank of G dollar vector. So, so uh, now you can plot again, and because you can't see anything, it would be nice probably to multiply the values a little bit. So let's multiply the values instead of uh, just simple page rank, let's multiply them by, I think 10 was the right thing, maybe, or 5, I don't remember, no, 10. No, even more, so numbers, I'm, uh, yeah, okay, so let's, uh, actually, yeah, 100 is good. 100 is good? Yeah. Okay, by 100. So the V of G size page rank vector times 100. Okay, so we multiply them by the values of page rank by 100. And so now if you plot, you're going to get this kind of graph. So can I see the Word document again? I think I've missed a step. I just can't tell from... The Word document? So did you go from the edge to the penis line? I put in those three bottom lines. No, you don't uh, need to. Here, here's what you need. Uh, v of G size, uh, dollar size, assignment, page dot rank of G, right? Here's on the screen, it's highlighted. Okay, dollar vector times 100. And now plot again, and you should have this kind of thing. Okay? So you need the same room, it's not a equivalence relationship here. Right. It's, well, it's because it's an aggregate of everything. Yeah, but the red yeah. color is being in the same room. Right. They were at some point at oh, the same room. Oh, at some point we're in the same room. room. Okay. Yeah. yeah. 
It's not an equivalence relation, it's correct. It's a good <laughs> term. <laughs> so um, now we can start, you know, staring at this network. It's a tiny network, but but still. We can start making all kinds of hypotheses maybe about it. Um, so what is page rank? Page rank, it, you have higher page rank. It's, an, it's a recursive kind of thing. Your page rank is higher if you are being pointed to individuals with higher page rank. So uh, you can think of it, and that's where it came from, is the notion of authority. How, uh, and, and it was developed in many contexts, the latest being for, by Google, and that's the underlying ranking value for the, their search results for all the web pages out there. What is an important web page? What's an important, an authoritative web page? Well, an authoritative web page, right, is the one that's being linked to by many other web pages. And the more authoritative those web pages are themselves, the more authoritative it makes the page that's being linked to by these other authoritative page, web pages, right? I am an authority because all the other authorities in the field are linking to me, are looking to me for information. Therefore, I am the, the more, more of an authority. There is a very quick way to actually compute it on page rank. Um, you can start with random, uh, the way it's done, there are several ways. It, it, it converges to the first eigenvalue of the weighted uh, relations matrix of the adjacency matrix of, of, of this of the network so if you have a matrix of individuals by individuals and in the entry IJ you have uh, how many times has individual I pointed to J right so if you take the first eigenvalue of that matrix, the largest eigenvalue of that matrix, that's the page rank for each, the, the vector of that eigenvalue, the first eigenvector is the page rank value for each node. So you can con 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 uh, compute it in many different ways, you can start just with a random distribution of values for everybody and then each node uh, is the average of values gets the value which is the average of values of all the nodes pointing to it and you can and you do this iteratively many times and it eventually converges to the same thing and so that's what Google how Google ranks all the web pages out there and that's the page rank value when when you return search results they are ranked in a particular order and the ranking is given by the web pages that way, the, the each web page's page rank value. It allowed Google to give a good ranking of all those billions of pages that are out there, and 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 it's the patented technology uh, with a lot of tweaking to 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 sort of adjust for things like, well, you know, the page like Google is going to be linked to by many other pages, but it's not necessarily authority on anything. So, so what does it tell us here? It tells us here that tells us here that this particular individual, which is Alice, so she's a female. It's blue. Um, her index is zero. It's uh, it's Alice. She's important because she's linked to, but you know, she's linked to essentially everybody. Almost everybody links to her, right? And then. Uh, including this individual uh, Bob who also links to her and he's linked to by other important individuals why are they important because other individ important individuals are linking to them right so there is this uh, who is the least important person here is this is this whatever woman out out there who is not linked to by pretty much anybody except for Alice and that's it Okay. 
So now we can ask questions about, you know, the importance of information flow, because PageRank tells us something about information flow, about, you know, if we look only at the advice network, who are the people going to for advice? Um, if, you know, is it more women, is it more men? Uh, are women giving more advice than receiving? So we can start asking all kinds of questions like this and start formulating hypotheses and computing measures on this network and compare different modes of the network. So I'm not going to go in a lot more detail, so now that you're started and you can play with it, I'm just going to point out that R has a reasonably good manual. So uh, if you go where, our, uh, where uh, iGraph is, so iGraphSourceForge.net uh, slash doc, so if you go to iGraphSourceForge.net itself, the original, you can go to documentation and under our package there is the browse online and there is the index of all the commands of, uh, that R has for iGraph, the iGraph package has. So, for example, if you, if, you're, if you don't know, well, how would I compute communities now? I have no idea. Well, let's search. Communities. So, here's all the commands that have, that, that deal with communities in iGraph. Did you type that? I didn't say it. Well. So, I did search con uh, command F or control F for depending on Windows. Oh, you did it. You did it. Okay, I see where you did it. Okay. okay. And I searched for the word communities in this index of all the commands of uh, iGraph package. And here's, here are the commands that deal with communities in iGraph. And it says, uh, here, let's look at commands that, communities. Let's see what it says. So, um, sorry, actually, let's do this. So the, these are the common functions supporting community detection algorithms, um, and there are several of them. Here's all of them. So there's community to membership takes, uh, takes a matrix. So that takes the result of community structure detection algorithm. So I want the community detection algorithm, right? And um, there is, here, here it says, there's the edge between this community. There, is, there are several algorithms that do various community detection methods. There is the walk trap, edge between us, fast, greedy, and spin glass. The problem... Like, like, like some sort of simulated annealing algorithms? No. So, uh, as an aside... <laughs> so, as an aside, for whatever legacy reasons, um, it seems that probably by contagion from physicists. The, um, the, 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 the height of optimization algorithms in sciences seems to be simulated annealing algorithm. Simulated annealing is only one type of, one type of heuristic, not an algorithm, heuristic, because it's not guaranteed to produce correct results, of optimizing, of finding optimal values. It works well for physics, it works well under certain circumstances, it works well in, in numerical, uh, when you're looking for numerical optimization. It doesn't work well in networks. So, or any other combinatorial structures. Even for numerical optimization, we, they're, they're pretty, there are other algorithms. So simulated annealing is from 1980s. We've, we've, we've had other optimization algorithms since. So, for example, here to find communities, there are what? four methods. Right. There are four methods shown that find. Yeah. So. Right. What what separates? Right. So there are different ways of defining what community is, and we still haven't even agreed among ourselves or sociologists among themselves what a community is, because a community. The problem is, remember, guys, all our discussions about clustering in statistics that clusters are a collection of points that are closer to each other than they are to points in other clusters, right? 
So there are many, many methods for doing clustering. Why? Because it's a vague concept. What's a cluster? The problem is that community is essentially a cluster in networks. A community is a set of individuals, a collection of individuals that are more connected among themselves than they are to individuals in other communities. So that's the discrete combinatorial equivalent, that's the network equivalent of a cluster. And because it's a vague, dis vague notion, vague concept, just like a uh, cluster in general is in statistics, Depending on what your measure of goodness of a cluster is, you're going to get different ways to find those clusters because they're optimizing for different things. So the same thing is in communities. Edge between this community is probably among those four um, the easiest to understand and most commonly used and, 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 and is reasonably meaningful. So the way... The, 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 the intuition behind this method, method is that remember the notion of betweenness for, for each edge? So the higher the betweenness, the more paths between different individuals go through that edge. Essentially, more of a bottleneck edge it is. And if you have different communities, right, if you truly have different communities and only one edge connecting between them, then that edge is going to have very high between us because it lies between different communities. So the edge between us community detection algorithm, the way it works, it computes between us for all the edges and then takes the edge with the highest between us and removes it from the network. And then... Right, so, so, so that it's a hierarchical sort of clustering method. So it removes the edge with the highest between us. If at that point you, you, you disconnected your network into, say, two components, great. Those are two, those are gotta be two separate communities. If not, you recompute between us now because you removed one edge and so the paths, paths have changed. So you recompute between us on all the edges and remove the, neck, the edge with the highest between us and keep going that way until you have uh, your graph has fallen apart into different connected components. So that's what this uh, edge between this community does. And, and how do you know um, with that sort of algorithm, how do you determine, so for example, if I have a, a, a network that you know, might have multiple communities in it, uh, I can remove an edge and find that it falls apart into two, but maybe if there's some real community structure to one of the subclusters that's left. So you keep going. So right, right. So the question is, how do you know when to stop? Right. So, so great. It's a great question. Uh, the measure that's used, it's called modularity. It's the relative it, modularity is the connectivity within each cluster within each community versus a cross. And so when if you go to so clearly if you if you haven't gone far enough, then the den, then your community what you think of as community, which are comprised of several communities, are not gonna be connected enough. So the connectivity within what you think is a cluster versus a cross is not going to be uh, is going to be reasonably equal. Then, as you go ahead, sorry. As you keep on doing it, right? Then you, then you kind of, if you get get really lucky, and you now have separated your communities hierarchically into really dense clusters that are sparsely connected. So your ratio of connectivity within versus across is going to be now really high. And if you keep separating them more and more, it's going to start. The ratio starts dropping again. So the density stays really high in terms of... Right, because now your density within versus across is the same, but not because they're sparse, because both of them are pretty pretty connected. Exactly. So, so even distribution of densities yeah. in each community so that they represent equivalent modules and hence are separate communities. Right, so that, that's kind so, of... So yeah. This S-betweenness algorithm is a method for trying to optimize the modularity of the group structure that you in that you uh, that you detect in the network. Exactly, and so 
why don't we then the question should be why don't we directly find the 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 separation the partition of the nodes within this network that 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 maximize the modularity of that partition right yeah well the question the, that's a, that would be a wonderful problem that maybe what we should be doing except you guys remember from uh, Sanjeev Arora's lecture probably he talked about NP complete problems right or uh, computationally hard problems, provably computationally hard problems, NP hard problems. Um, he must have used some version of that in his uh, lecture, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's one of those. So, so modularity optimization, finding the partition of maximum modularity within a network, is one of those computationally hard problems. It's one of the harder ones of those. We don't even have good guarantees on heuristics that do this but empirically empirically edge between us seems to be performing reasonably well on actual real world networks to approximate maximum modularity partition so what was the walkabout one those are going for so what was the first one uh the, the walk trap um, so that's yeah, kind of a probabilistic, uh, if I remember correctly, it's a probabilistic method. So if you keep on walking, if you keep on, if you, if you keep walking within a network, then you get trapped more within one community, right? Mm -hmm. Randomly. Uh, right, so it's a random walk. So, so short random walks tend to stay within the same community. To get out of community, it takes really long time probabilistically to get outside of a community. It takes the number of steps to get out, essentially, so... It takes longer than that, probabilistically, uh, if you're wandering randomly. Because within it... Once if, you get... If you walk a lot of steps from different starting points, then, you're, then it, it, they're really big subgroups. Right, so you can tend to walk for a while within the same community. Because they're all well-connected, right? So they, you will tend to... Uh, uh, at random, if you choose a neighbor at random, you're going to choose a neighbor from the same community. The fast and greedy is probably the worst possible way to detect communities uh, because it's, it's while it directly optimizing modularity score, uh, it actually turns out in reality pre to perform worse than the edge between us um, heuristic to optimize it. And I don't remember what the spin glass one is, but it probably explains it. No, it doesn't. <laughs> That's the simulated annealing one. So I, I, I'm not sure how well it performs. Okay. okay. So you can detect communities. You can then export all of the parameters that you're computing. You can export them as a column. You can write them down as a column in your Excel file and uh, do statistical analysis on those. I want to spend just five minutes talking about dynamic networks. So, um, Tanya, it's, yeah. it's, it's 6.25 here. Right. You're not going to be able to finish in five minutes. I, actually, I, 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 I can. <laughs> so I just want to, to put that notion that, that uh, if you... So, so far we've talked about a network that doesn't change in time. Here it is. Once given, it's, it remains so forever and ever. And so uh, a lot of the networks, pretty much every network you can think of, uh, really changes in time. And, uh, oops. Uh, and, the, uh, and the problem is, so what do we do with networks that change, that change over time? One way is uh, one way is to uh, compute sorry compute parameters for each time step of the network. So suppose you have oops suppose you have uh, this you know there are networks there are six individuals five time step the interactions that happen within each time step. These are three different versions of uh, a network that changes over time that all result in the same sort of aggregate view of this network. And 
one way to deal with dynamic networks. You can compute between this page rank, whatever else you want to compute about each network, and then look at the time series of those measures, right? And do correlations of, on time series. So what we have been doing over the last seven years in collaboration with Dan and at, uh, sort of driven by questions that were, have been coming from Dan and Shiva and Ilya, his postdoc, is developing method for direct analysis of these uh, networks. And one of them is communities. So we, we have a collection of those, but the communities I just want to show quickly. Um, so if you look at community in communities, in uh, static communities, here's the same Gravy Zebra uh, network that Dan showed last time. So if you were point to a community in this, in this network, a kind of dense cluster within the network, you know, probably most of you would identify this as a community. And Dan talked about it last time that, well, kind of. But turns out, if you look at it over time, it's not really. And so, uh, Chayant, you want to wave? Here's Chayant, who is a, whom you see as a little black out of shape up out there in the back. Um, his PhD is on, on developing methods for identifying dynamic communities, which is fluid clusters of individuals over time where membership can change, switch a little bit of a turnover, a little bit of a, a fuzziness, but still there's some cohesiveness to, to those groups over time. Um, and so there is a working method now. And if you work, uh, if you apply it to this, the same gravy zebra network, which is over time, which is on the right here, it identifies actually, so now time goes from top to bottom, and each line in, is an observation here in time. Those boxes are groups of individuals of zebras that were observed together. So here, there were two groups. There is this blue one and the green one. The rest were not seen on that day, turns out. So Chance method gave this coloring. It told us, well, here's the green community, here's the red community. And, and, and these kind of red and green, they split and merge, which is the fish and fusion species, right? So they fish and fuse. And if you, yeah? Can you just explain the rule for why the green, when it merged with the pink, became pink? Um, this is for particular setting of parameters. If you set it slightly different, it's going to become green, but because in this case, there were more reds than greens, and so they it's all. A, it's, a, it's a dominant. It's a dom. It's a. It's a. It's a. It's a law of numbers, right? So to the first approximation, yes. Six yes. and five. There are six and five. It's going to be the color of the six. Uh, all else being equal, yes. So if you color now these individuals by the color of their of the community they spend most of the time in here, so you you just count how many times they were red, how many times they were green. So, and you superimpose it on the original aggregate network. Here's what you get. And now you can re see that there are truly two communities here. And if you read off, uh, there is this little uh, labels, the number of individual with L, 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 well, N. And then here's the N, 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 N. So the red ones are the non-lactating females and the green ones uh, for the most part lactating females and we know, I've, as far as I remember actually 13 switched, it recent, it, it, it used to be lactating. And there's this, right, and the, and the stallion is, is, uh, is, is, is hanging around with the lactating females for the most part. Okay. Well, he's the, he's the purple one, right? I can't, I can't No, no, tell, here, he's... this one, the stallion is the green one, he's hanging around with lactating females. Okay, so so it tells you a lot more about the biology, which Dan can tell you more about. <laughs> and if you compare uh, two populations of uh, two two dynamic networks, right? So that those were the Gravis and the Onagers, and he, the, these are their static networks, with a lot of the measures like diameters and and clustering coefficient and everything being very similar in static networks. You can now compare the dynamic networks and, for example, dynamic communities 
without knowing much else, but you, knowing that the color represents these communities, the best we can infer, you can see that there is a lot more cohesiveness among the gravy zebras than among the uh, onagers. So, so uh, one way to sort of interpret it is that communities matter, social, social relationships matter among gravies and matter a lot and much more random uh, and matter a lot less among the onagers. So why that is biologically, Dan can tell you, maybe not in these five minutes, <laughs> but in general. But we can, we can use this method. There's a whole uh, suite of methods that we've developed. So if you ask questions that pertain to the dynamics of interactions, we, we have now a whole suite of tools that can answer uh, questions on dynamic networks, which are not part of iGraph, not part of anything else. Um, and we have our own um, tools that do that. So next time, on Monday, it's on Monday, not Wednesday, uh, Ian is going to talk about collective behavior, so truly dynamic interactions, where dynamics truly matter, and how, uh, be specifically because uh, I believe he's going to talk about emergence of collective behavior from individual behavior. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, the week after that, Carrie and Jason are going to talk about visualizing dyn uh, your data of all kinds in creative ways, in, an, in ways that actually helps understand what's going on. So, so notice even a simple visualization of a network gave us a lot more information than just looking at the numbers of page ranks or the numbers of betweenness because it, it, it gives us more intuition to look at, at the network view of it. And so Kerry uh, and, and Victor and Jillian, guys, if you wave, would be nice. And uh, Chiwa and Jason Lee, who is um, uh, Jason Lee, who is uh, the co-instructor on our side here. They are all from the Electronic Visualization Lab here, and their whole uh, life revolves around visualizing data from. NASA missions and deep core Arctic explorations to zebras on uh, running around landscapes, which is what Kerry did for his master's and continuing doing other stuff.